Good evening. On behalf of the Flenge Professional Development Committee, I would like to welcome you to Flenge's second web chat for educators for the 2017-2018 year. This evening's web chat is entitled Content and Connections. My name is Amanda Seawald, and I'll be hosting this evening's webinar and presenting. Our web chat series is a new professional development offering to the world language education community. Our web chats are designed to bring important ideas and conversations to our members through the experts on our board of directors and guests. Please note that the audio and video of this webinar will be recorded. I will provide you with details about how you can access the on-demand recording uh, later at, through email. This webinar is scheduled to last one hour uh, with the opportunity to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question of the presenter during the presentation, please use the chat or question feature in the GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see the chat box and you can send in your question. We will organize the questions and share them with the presenter during the presentation at, at uh, designated question periods. As a registered live participant, you're eligible to receive a certificate of attendance stating that you signed up for and logged into this web chat. Details on how to receive this will be shared at the end of the web chat and through email. Flenge cannot guarantee any professional development credit for this web chat. For those watching this on demand at a later date, Flenge is unable to grant a certificate of attendance. All participants are encouraged to work with their immediate supervisors to determine how best to receive credit for this professional development. In the event of any technical difficulties, please remain connected to the web chat as you are able. Flenge will contact you directly if the problem cannot be resolved. You may also email us at president at flenge.org. But please understand that it is sometimes not possible to check email and run the webinar simultaneously. Thank you for your time and attention to these messages. And now let me take the opportunity to, to introduce you to our co-presenter tonight, Monica Uke. Monica is the pre-K through third grade Spanish teacher at Far Hills Country Day School. In her 25 plus years as a Spanish teacher, she has taught pre-K through college level. Monica received her BS in biology and an MAED in curriculum and instruction from Virginia Tech. Passionate about integrating both subject areas and the use of technology in the classroom, she has worked as technology integrator for the lower school at Far Hills. Monica has presented at various venues throughout her years teaching, and most recently at Flenge, PSMLA, and NECFL. As a member of NJAIS, Monica has led smart training workshops, seesaw workshops, and giving world language presentations at the biannual conference and at professional development events. Monica enjoys rethinking lessons to include content in other subject areas as well as technology. Teaching is a vibrant, active profession with new things to try and learn every day, and Monica subscribes to that idea. <laughs> Monica, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would like to introduce Amanda, our, our, um, <laughs> our host and presenter as well. So Amanda is the owner and author of the Maracas Language Programs and Learning Kaleidoscope Educational Consulting. Maracas publishes innovative curriculum materials and music to enhance language instruction and learning. She has been teaching, coaching, and developing curricula for 18 years. Her expertise is multilingual, multicultural curriculum and instruction. She works with educators and schools across the country and in Europe to develop meaningful language programs. She is a regular presenter at national, regional, and state conferences. As an advocate for language education, Amanda works with the federal and state legislative offices to garner support for legislation and funding. Her advocacy work in New Jersey led to the signing of the Seal of Biliteracy into law in 2016. She is also the president of the Foreign Language Educators of New Jersey and serves on the executive board of the Joint National Committee on Language and on the Board of Directors for the Pulsera Project. She is the New Jersey State Representative for the National Network of Early Language Learning. Amanda is a speaker of Spanish, French, and Japanese. Welcome, and thank you. Oh, thank you. This is very exciting for us to be able to do this together tonight. Monica and I have had the opportunity to work together and share our ideas for the last several years in professional settings and just informally. So the idea of a web chat is really for it to be a conversation that she and I will have about these ideas that we want to share with you, sharing some of the experiences that we've had and some ideas that can help you can take right back to your classroom and use right away. Uh, if you have a question, again, please feel free to write it into the chat box. You can also send them by email. But as I said, it's very difficult for us to check while we're talking. We'll do our best to do that. So let me start by asking you, have you ever seen something that doesn't seem to have a purpose? 
like the hole at the edge of a pot or the hole on the edge on the end of an, a pen cap or what about those little lines on the f and the and the j keys on your keyboard do you know what those are for well just to tell you that the hole at the edge of your pot is to hold your spoon it's a spoon rest and the hole on the end of a pen cap is so that you won't choke if you swallow it and the le the lines on your keyboard are of course to help you find that home position so you can type But what about objects that change in the right person's hands? For example, a guitar or a pencil, they don't have as much meaning until you put them in the right person's hands. I have to say that Miss Prince and, and certainly his hands on a guitar were the most amazing ones. The magic that could take place yeah. when J.K. Rowling wrote a Harry Potter book, we all know the transformative experience that that is. Right, Monica? Yes, exactly. I've read all of them. <laughs> Well, what we want to talk about tonight is that language is a tool for bigger and more important purposes as well. And it needs to function to demonstrate its worth. It can't just be something that we're learning about, but it needs to be functional in order for people to really understand why we're learning it. Mm -hmm. Here we have the AP Global Strands. And to my mind, there is no better resource for really understanding how to teach about ideas through language. Uh, and we think about College Board and AP as something that starts only in the high school level. But from my experience, and I know from Monica's as well, yeah. the AP Global Strands are a great building block. Yeah, I usually use these because I teach I teach the lower um, the lower grade levels. But these are just as important for me because this is where I want my students to be able to get. So when I look at these, I actually use them. Um, for the elementary grades as what do they need to know at the correct, at the age level they're at right now in order to be able to talk about these um, things later on in life. Yeah, later on in life, as well as if you look at some of these ideas through contemporary life and some of the other ideas, you can see that these connect right back to those old vocabulary lists that we used to depend on for all of our all of our units. So really, it, it gives us a springboard. And I would love for all of you to keep that in your minds as we're talking about this tonight. So let's talk a little bit about content. What does that mean? What does that look like? Where do we get it? And and how can it work for FLESS programs as well as in middle school and high school programs? The most important thing that I can tell you about this is that the only way that the future of language education can be a positive one is if we link our content and we link our experience, our classroom experiences to the core objectives of the school, the core objectives academically. If we focus on essential skill development. And if we demonstrate that the type of learning going on in our classrooms directly applies to everything else that a student is doing in their day. The great news about this is that content is really fun. Language arts and math and science and social studies are wonderful ways to approach learning. And the more we can focus on these ideas, the better chance we have of engaging our students. I'm going to jump in here because this um, this is really one of the biggest uh, lessons I've learned in my professional development is I've been teaching for such a long time, there came a point where I kept thinking, why? Why am I teaching colors and numbers? Why am I teaching this song? What are they going to do about it? And I realized that attaching all of the things that I do to a content or a discipline area makes more sense. It allows the school, um, or not the school, it allows the kids to connect what they're doing in my language class to everything they do in their day, which I think is an extremely important um, it's a hook for them, for the kids to do. Yes, absolutely. And that hook is critical for us to be able to get them to really understand and, and enjoy the experience. If students aren't enjoying it, then we've missed the boat, in my opinion. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. And to that end, I often have teachers that I work with asking me, well, what am I supposed to include and, and what can I do? And it's it's too much. Well, what you can do is you can really focus on some very specific ideas. And what you can do is look for the opportunity to collaborate with other teachers across your, your building and your district to know what's going on in the other classrooms and have some type of opportunity to mirror what's happening. What you cannot do is expect yourself to teach everything. It's impossible. 
There's no way to, to let that happen. So it's very important for you to make certain decisions about what you're going to include. And you can't yeah. expect students to learn every word. It's not yeah. about memorizing vocabulary. And that's one of the most important things that we have to realize as language educators. It's about how are we going to create structural experiences and experiential learning opportunities that require students to use language. And that language can be available to them on walls and in every part of every classroom that you're in. I'm going to jump in and say that one of my um, one of the key things that I've learned when I first started this, I thought of it as my role is to either introduce a topic and get them interested in it and then send them off to math and science and let them really learn the content or to review something that they've already done. And that's a, a simple starting point and it doesn't make it look so large um, when you're working with this or when you're just starting to do content in your classes. And that leads perfectly into what we're going to talk about here, which is I have teachers who say to me, well, yeah, but I'm a language teacher. I, you know, I, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, I, I don't teach content. But the idea is that the elementary language, the elementary standards across uh, content can be great starting points for any level. I, they're very general concepts that we can look at and we can create the goal of communication of ideas and of answering questions and of asking questions that make it much more hands on for the students and give the learners a purpose. Exactly what Monica was describing is why are they mm -hmm. learning this? What can they do with this? And what do I want them to be able to do with this? And we should be mm -hmm. asking that as language teachers anyway. And then I mm -hmm. also get the question about how am I going to fit this into my classroom? Well, the answer is that the way that you instruct has to adjust and it doesn't have to change everything. But the way that you need to look at it is that if you're teaching in a vacuum, they're not learning. You start with simple activities. You look at the materials that are readily available to you and you share your resources. And the one thing that I, I have to say is that you can't expect to do everything, nor should you. Take little pieces, even if you take one little item from what we show you tonight and use it, you'll see a difference. And my feeling as an advocate is that it's not possible for us to decide to not do this. We must do this and make learning in languages tied to what the students are learning across the rest of their days uh, in order for us to be considered a vital part of the academic experience. You need to, I want to um, talk, it, it, it sounds very large and very big, but just keep it simple. Think about um, one example, when I started doing and I, I always do animals because the kids love animals well I found out that the second grade does a penguin unit and I thought hmm I can describe penguins using the colors and grande pequeño the simple words that I'm already doing in the class but the key here then what I started doing was think about how they can utilize the language to communicate the information that they're learning about penguins and things like that so it's all it's it's focus on on what you need to do as a language teacher, but using the topics that are provided by science, math, language, arts, history, any of the content that you're familiar with. I also would like to um, let you know that I choose science because that's my I have a, a I studied biology. That's what I'm familiar with. But you can do this with any other subject. I mean, and just think about all of the things that you're already doing. If you do a time unit, you're doing math. If you're doing, um, if you're doing numbers, you can easily do measurement. You can easily do it. It's not just math problems. You can do other things that are, that are math oriented. Absolutely. And, you know, just this page here talks about, you know, how we develop our objectives. It's what will students be able to do with what we're going to show them and teach them and, and get and provide for them with regard to experiences. And it's very important to see how this goes across the different content areas. So, of course, Monica just spoke about science. I feel very strongly about the way that science as inquiry is such an essential piece of what all students need to be able to do. And, and one of the things we need to remember as language teachers is we're often teaching students words and concepts and, you know, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, still very focused on grammar. But what we need to be focusing on is the concept of getting students to inquire, getting them to solve problems. Often we have teachers who don't have we don't have a unit when where was the unit on teaching the question words never happened right monica we never had that nope. <laughs> but the bottom line is that that's one of the most important things if not the most important thing that our students can learn to do and if you think about proficiency as a ladder 
And if you think about the way you climb from one proficiency level to the next, one of the two of the most important pieces of that will be, can the students develop their own questions and ask them? And can the students compare and contrast ideas? Science is really low hanging fruit for the opportunities that you can give them to to explore that and to understand it. So this is an example of how um, one of the units that I did. Now, this is um, I did this with a second grade class. But after talking to the science teacher, we came up with these things and finding out what. And by the way, this is also tying in with a language arts um, unit that they were doing on writing all about a certain animal also. So I we talked together and I thought, well, they she said we're describing penguins. And I'm like, hmm, I can do that in Spanish. They can do colors. They can do numbers. Tiene dos ojos, dos aletas. Tiene una cola pequeña de salta. You know, so you can do all of those things. Superlative. Who's bigger? They com you talked about comparing and contrasting. There's the superlatives. It's más grande que. It's it, there. This penguin is smaller than that penguin. This penguin is larger than the other penguin. And then you can also integrate other things. If if you um, I use technology, so that's why I have tech commands in there. But if you notice, most of the bulk of the actual content is being done in science. And you know that it's it's successful and that the kids are enjoying it and they're learning when the science teacher comes to you and says, oh, my gosh, they're using all the body parts in Spanish in my class. <laughs> so that to me was a very um, a very nice reward for for switching to this type of unit. Yes, absolutely. And Monica, you know, obviously Monica is using ex examples in Spanish, but just the concepts of using these different types of language, these pieces of language that end up becoming the tools that we're using to express bigger ideas. And that's ultimately we want what we want our students to be able to do. Yeah, this is an example of um, it is a video, but you um, I don't know why you need permission to view this video. But um, if maybe after we share the presentation, it'll come on. But you can see um, what the kids are able to do. It's not a lot. And the key to, to getting students to do this is to give them um, structures or uh, I call them puzzle pieces. You build it as a puzzle. I give them the things that we haven't presented and they fill in and change the sentences to make it their own. And it's those structures how I introduce grammar points to a second grade class without teaching grammar. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to point out something about that. As we're talking about how we you know, present this to students and how they get it with or without the grammar or how we incorporate it, I really want everyone to consider the, how beautiful our language classrooms can be if you have your own classroom. I've walked into so many language classrooms with the most beautiful pictures and posters of different countries. But the bottom line is we are not in the business of getting kids to memorize words or memorize structures. What we want them to do is use them. And if you consider your walls to be learning tools and look at them as a, a springboard for students when they're when you're getting them to do an interpersonal activity or speak to each other or do an experiment in science, that any of those things, when they run out of their words or if they get to a point where they're not sure what to say and you've given them structures and you've given them words on the walls. And they're there and the, the print is there and available to them. They're not going to go back into English. They'll stay in the target language if they know where to look to find it. So consider turning your classroom into a, a living, breathing, interactive environment where the walls actually can, can help them learn. And of course, when we talk yeah. about social studies, culture is such a, a very strong focus, global connections. But in addition to that, the idea of geography, uh, something that I know that we incorporate into a lot of our 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 programs to learn about where the language is spoken. But I encourage everyone to consider not only making comparisons and contrasts to the countries where your, lang your target language is spoken. Students need to be able to compare and contrast with other countries around the world in the target language. And it will provide for a much more in-depth opportunity for comparison and contrast, which will grow proficiency, if you compare and contrast to uh, more places around the world, places that have very different experiences. I have to say that geography, um, I don't know how it is in other schools, but in my school, I, I really feel that geography is often overlooked and there's a large focus on, on the, the community and the state, but there is not really, 
you know, people still don't know. I, we have people that don't know where Argentina is or, or France or a country in Africa. So doing this, you know, studying South America as a whole is really good because there are 21 uh, Spanish speaking countries. There are very many French speaking countries. It, a lot of countries don't speak English and it's good for the kids to realize where these places are in relation to their own. Um, to where they are in in the globe in in the in the world. True, I, and and of course mathematics is it, math is folded into everything we do. I know that Monica mentioned before when we're talking about numbers, when you're talking about time. But in addition to that, the ways that you can incorporate real life math into your classroom is through graphing, through taking doing surveys and having them compare and contrast the more than or less than concepts. All of those ideas fit right into math. I often in my classrooms, I will ask students questions and they have to answer them by lining up. It's a Kagan structure actually actually called lineups where they're basically lining up and creating a living bar graph. I, I might ask them, what is their favorite season to get the uh, conversation started about some different ideas about the seasons? And they would have to line up according to their favorite season. I will stand on a chair and take a picture of them from above so that they can see eventually we can actually display what that looked like. Then I might ask them to change based on when their birthdays are. All of these ideas have a visual and kinesthetic experience for them with math in the target language. It gives them more to talk about. It gives them more to respond to. And I find that it, it really motivates the students. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's time. Time and money are two really big ones that I never really thought of as math um, happening. And when they when when I was told when we were talking, I was talking with another teacher and a classroom teacher. And she kept saying, oh, they don't know any of the numbers. They, they can't figure out the coins and stuff. And I was like, but wait, I do that in my class. How? And she was like, really, you could let them practice. So that's another key aspect of doing content area things is that. Teachers will welcome the additional practice of concepts that they're doing in their own class in another subject area. That's true. And anything to bolster the learning. I find that when when we have people who 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 uh, appreciate what we're doing, who are in the regular classroom and, and they can really appreciate what we're doing to bolster the learning and the, the instruction that they're providing, then it makes us more valuable to our schools. Language arts is a perfect example of that as well. And I say that because uh, one of the biggest goals that we have as proficiency growers is to develop by literacy. And you would think that with with many grades, we don't have a lot of time with them. But if we really look at the way that we break down opportunities to read and to to write even in the in the target language to concepts that go all the way back to elementary school, whether you're teaching elementary students, middle school students, or high school students, ideas like story parts, ideas like um, organizing your ideas in a, in a uh, graphic organizer, or ideas mm -hmm. that go along with response to literature, like a literature circle, can be a huge difference in the way that students acquire language and really take it in and, and learn it. Mm -hmm. So I want to pause here for a minute in case anyone has any questions. Feel free to write into the chat box and I'll be glad to uh, to answer your questions. Uh, if you don't have questions now and you want to hold them for later, that's fine. We're going to stop again in a little while. Um, but feel free to send those questions in there. If you're having trouble accessing the chat box, you can also email me at president at and I will try to answer them as we go along. But we know that the most important thing for all of us is that in order to make any of this content a reality, a real learning experience for our students, we must provide comprehensible input. The two things that you see here are examples of infographics that are wonderful tools for comprehensible input. They're visual, the language is simple, it's limited, but it provides a lot of information that can be used for comparing, for discussing, and for all of the ways that we try to reach out to students and get them to use the three modes in order to uh, to learn the language. I have to, I, I love comprehensible input in, in my classes and I use images, cognates, symbols, um, all sorts of things. And, and I really, even with my little ones, I can, I can stay the 25 minutes out of the 30 minutes in the target language because of the use of, of images in, in my classroom. 
Absolutely. And I love this robot. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> Monica and I were talking about my robot. This robot is my planning robot for the three modes. And I created it to really try to get teachers to see how planning using the three modes of instruction will help you get so much farther in what you're trying to do. But what we have to think about is the way that we probably used to do things is, oh, we'll do this and then we can watch the movie or we can watch the video later. That's truly the opposite way of what we should be doing. We need to start with interpretive opportunities, things that our students can hear, see, listen to, and understand, take in, in order to access some of the ideas and the words and the concepts that um, that we want them to be able to discuss interpersonally and, of course, ultimately be able to demonstrate through presentational activities. Uh, so just take a minute and think about your planning. It doesn't really require you to change things completely, but to look at things through a different lens and to consider how you can look through the lens of the three modes of communication to attack the idea of incorporating content. I want to come back. One of the I, I said I love this robot, and it's simply because of that arrow with the interp the input equals interpretive task going into the ear of the robot. And that to me, uh, one of my biggest worries was I never do enough interpretive tasks. I never. And when I saw this robot, I was like, but wait, I do. <laughs> and I just haven't been realizing every time you introduce a new uh, a new set of vocabulary, a new concept, a new content area. Anytime you use an image, anytime that you're dancing around, you stay in the target language. All of that is input and they understand. But you can look at their faces. You can if you're giving them a direction and they respond to you. You all of that is an interpretive task, which to me that it, it opened up my eyes and thinking, wait a minute, I do do more interpretive tasks um, than than I thought I did. And just um, like a robot, Monica, right, just like a robot, our yeah. students can't perform unless we provide yeah. that input first. Exactly. And, and you know, going back to using your walls, I have a word wall where I have the, the words in, um, in the target language with an image. But when I ask when the kids are using those tools and I have diff I have a color one, a season, weather, I have numbers, I have classroom objects and I have the word wall. Just think of that. That is actually reading, which is an interpretive task. They have to figure out what word, how to spell a word. Instead of coming and asking you in English, I, you know, my go-to is I point to the wall. <laughs> and they're like, oh, and that's an opportunity for them to read, which at my level, they, you know, they, they're not that good in English either, but they are learning. It's an interpretive because they're getting input on the letters and they're trying to say the word and match the words that they're sounding with what they're seeing in print, which it's it's really that also goes into the target staying 90 percent into the target language but i i bet i guarantee that everybody does a lot more interpretive tasks than you give yourself credit for and it's a, it's really a question of doing them in an order that allows for the students to really take ideas in so that they have something to talk about in those interpersonal yeah tasks. yeah that's another reason why I like it, because I like this order of the robot. And and you do start with the interpretive. You do start with the presentation. You play games. You get them to listen. And then the, the other activities that you do gets them to produce the language. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the unit is when you do your presentational task. Right. So here is an example of really kind of a planning document that I've put together for many teachers that I work with um, each day. Concept idea, idea, talking about your time frames. And I'm a big fan of not making things too long. I know that in the past we've had maybe those giant units that are maybe two or three months long and they're focused on something like food. And where do you go with that really? It's really more more like a list of words, right? You know, and so what we want to do is we want to turn that on its head, make it more of an inquiry driven experience for students, something that that pulls them into solving problems and thinking about ideas that go beyond just a list of words or even some some structures. So the time frames can be slightly shorter um, or they can stay the same, but it needs to have more depth. And so I, I encourage my teachers to look at theme and overarching questions first and to really separate out their objectives. They should have language objectives and they should have content objectives. And the language objectives should be very focused on those 
concepts of, of uh, structure and any of the ideas that you want them to be able to use, uh, developing questions or anything in the language. The content objectives should apply directly to what that theme is. What are those overarching questions and what do you want your students to be able to say or do with this? Uh, then, of course, there's a space for the words and phrases, the vocabulary, the sentence frames. And I can't st state that enough. Sentence frames are the key to keeping students in the target language. So I highly recommend considering placing a wall on your in your classroom or somewhere that your students yeah. are collecting sentence frames or that they're able to see them. Uh, I like I think that all of those ideas in the target language will are wonderful stepping stones for your students. And then, of course, I, I keep a section for resources where I I like to try and keep this as a digital document so that it can constantly be dynamic and changing. Um, and at the bottom, you see the way that we've kind of I've kind of broken it down to talk about the in, the anchor task, which is that interpretive piece that introduces concepts each time and interpersonal tasks, which need to be constant and, and often and all the time. And then your presentational tasks, which should develop over time. You can't ask a student to write a menu or to write a letter in the beginning of something before you've actually given them the opportunity to take in information about it. Yeah. So Monica, did you want to say anything about that? No, I, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> it's exactly what I do. And, and I, I have never seen what I do written out so concisely. <laughs> oh, well. So I, I really appreciate this. <laughs> well, Monica and I, we, we've noticed over time, and this is one of the beautiful things about, um, being involved with professional organizations is that over time we've gotten to know that we, we have a lot of the same patterns in the way that we instruct and the way that we think about language learning. So it's been a natural opportunity for us to work together on this. Yeah. And what I want to show with this slide is that your, your planning needs to be a repetitive patterned process. The more you get used to the concept of planning, having lots of activities and then giving the students the chance to show what they do, that's how we build towards that riser on the staircase of proficiency. When you think again about that, about proficiency as a staircase, each step, each stair that you step on is a plateau. We get there, they can say a sentence, they can answer with a few words, but it's the riser, the piece that goes up to the next step that always has to be worked on in order to allow them to, to be able to grow to that next level of proficiency. And those formative assessments within your activities every day are the pieces that are the building blocks of making that happen. There are mm -hmm. strategies all over the place, and we could spend an entire day on strategies for how to do this. Some that I like to point other, out. Another webinar. <laughs> yes, it would be several other webinars. But some that I like to point out that I always encourage teachers to, to look for, interactive notebooks I see as a, 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 a very important opportunity for students to show what they know in different ways than the way you present it to them. That's one opportunity. Obviously, mm -hmm. centers to me are the, the cornerstone of having an interactive classroom where everything is driven by clear objectives. And I have my teachers break down their centers by the modes so that if you're going to do centers in your classroom, the objectives are connected to uh, an activity that examines one of the one of the modes of communication. Uh, Ed Puzzle for me has been a life changing experience as an educator. If you haven't checked out Ed Puzzle, Wait until you see what it can do. And I'll just leave it at that. Literature circles for me, Harvey Daniels literature circles gives us a chance to get students to talk about text in a way that they otherwise may not be able to at earlier learning levels. Um, and if you take one thing away from tonight and as a strategy, tent card cues, I cannot say enough. It's the same idea as using your walls, but just having some cards, tent cards that stand on the desks or on the tables in your classroom so that students can refer to them when you're asking them to complete tasks so that they can use them to develop conversation. And of course, our old, our good old buddies, Quizlet and Kahoot, that every single student loves. Right, Monica? Yes, they they I've, I've actually started using these uh, two years ago. And what I like about it, it's that it's it's getting the kids to recall um information that they already have and they don't realize that they know it until they're working on a on a quizlet or a kahoot because i don't have any english in my quizlets or kahoots everything is in spanish you can do those sentence frames and get the kids to play with them and and it's absolutely amazing because they feel empowered and and they realize that they actually do know more than they think they do which to me if 
it's a better way of doing it than me telling them all the time. They see it for themselves. Yes, absolutely. And and I think that's oh. that's the key to having uh, success is that you have the kids engaged. They are able to recognize their own abilities much more when it's something that requires them to uh, really negotiate meaning in each at each step of the way. Yeah. So I did oh. an interactive. No, let me just I just did an interactive notebook with third grade this year as a review to figure out what they knew, and what they didn't know, what they remembered and what they couldn't. And and we ended up, um, again, using the sentence frames, writing a postcard that, that we sent to Mexico. So hopefully we'll get responses back in the spring. But I, I was actually quite impressed with how those interactive notebooks were and the idea that they can find their own answer to what they need in order to finish writing a, a thought or, or a sentence right. in this postcard was very empowering for them. And, and interactive notebooks, uh, you can certainly find a ton about it online, but if you have any questions about it, feel free to write to uh, both of us, one of us at the end. This slide is really just to get you to start to think about what the process is. But the process of being able to move from topic to theme what I mean by topic is going back to those old ideas of food and family and travel and clothes and all of those one word topics that really ultimately are only word lists, vocabulary lists, moving mm -hmm. into the broader ideas of theme. Where do clothes, where do, where do I get our clothes? How do we have a healthy diet? What are the types of things that we can do to recognize uh, family differences or family traditions? How are traditions different? Most recently, uh, in one of the schools I'm working with, we did a unit on family and traditions and how do we see traditions differently in different countries. And we were able to focus on birthdays around the world, not just the Spanish speaking or the French speaking world or the Chinese speaking world, but in the entire world. So we pulled in ideas from India and from Canada and from uh, all different parts of the world. In Ireland, by the way, in case you don't know it, apparently it's a tradition to turn someone upside down and bang their head on the floor the a number of times that it's there for, uh, for the years that it's that they're celebrating. <laughs> so there are all different things that you can That's find out Ireland and start to explore this. <laughs> The information is not hard to find, and I can tell you, having seen it firsthand, that as you move from topic to theme, you engage your students much, much in a much yeah. stronger way. You expand your teaching and you broaden the experience that your students have to allow them to have more of an immersion experience that has meaning. What are they trying to do? And and the question is, how do we take what we've had in textbooks for years and turn it into something much broader than this. And for that, right. I'll tell you a little bit about how I've done it in the past. So for me, I would start with something like a list, like the parts of the face or the body, and I would think about it. How can I connect this? Well, the, the natural content connection for me was science. And from there, how can I connect uh, to a, a smaller idea within science? And the best idea I had was to explore the five senses. And I love that idea because not only does exploring the five senses provide for interactive um, exper experiment op opportunities, so the students can actually do experiments with their five senses, but it also is the framework for developing descriptive language down the road. Once students learn about their five senses and can use them and uh, talk about them, they have the language and the capability to talk about anything in a much deeper with a much deeper description. So I started by using vocabulary and asking, making sure that students would be able to ask and answer questions about where each part of the body is able to put parts in order, describe body parts. And all of these ideas I applied to these scientific concepts of inquiry, prediction, making it constructivist so that they're actively creating their learning and always interactive. In order to achieve that, I ran experiments. I had them close their eyes and try to remember the number of windows in the classroom and talk about it. Talk about how we need our sense of sight. Uh, we'd had response journals to each one of the senses that we focused on. Of course, music is a very important part of everything I do. So songs were a part of each piece of this. And we had a culminating activity, which was really a five senses fair for my students. So that was how that was my process when I first started moving to a content driven experience. <laughs> I have to I have to interject here because that process is so similar to what I how I did mine as well. And, and it ended up, it was the five senses, started out the same way. And, and we ended up um, there after all of the 
we did we use songs and we I actually taught a couple of songs. We we have a song for the body parts and then we had another song for the senses. So we built even on the language. So they kept going. Um, they kept growing their language. And then the, our last activity was they created um, with faces I make. They created their own face. And then we used Book Creator and they and they wrote about and this is in kindergarten. It was a kindergarten class and they were able to record you know, ojos azul, you know, or even some of them even were able to say una boca roja, which is one red mouth. And so they put the numbers and the colors together with uh, with the body part, which was which was very interesting. So. Right. And, you know, I always talk, talk about things in context. Why would we bother teaching colors outside of the mm -hmm. context of using them for something? Why would we teach numbers outside of the context of using them for something? And so I always start my year talking about seasonal change because that's obvious with regard to um, to using colors, using our mm -hmm. five senses and really starting to learn and explore in that way. So this pl this planning, this is the planning document that we showed before. But now what we've done is we've broken it down to demonstrate how you can use the planning document and plug these pieces in. And of course, the, the piece that you don't see would be the next column where you would be able to put live links into your resources. Uh, look so that that way, every year as you move forward, you have a document that you can continue to grow with. Yeah. And then um, one thing I do, I always, when I'm looking at a unit, and I do this constantly, even I'm not one to write out the entire unit at the beginning. I have, I get an idea, I put it together. I do that basic structure that you saw in the previous slide and, and I have that idea and I have those resources. But then throughout the unit, I always revisit the standards, the actual standard. Do I have activities for communication? Are they doing interpersonal? And I'm very happy to find out today that I'm doing more interpersonal than I thought I was. Um, do I, I'm sorry, interpretive ones. And do I have the presentational at the end? My presentational is usually at the end of the unit. Um, how do I integrate culture? Because another interesting thing is you could have a content, for example, the, the five senses. What what is how do you compare and contrast the five senses? Are there any cultural differences between our culture the, in the U.S. and so, in Spanish speaking world in terms of the five senses? Um, can I make comparisons it, with with my students? And then how can I collaborate? I'm I'm a big proponent of of trying to do more collaborations and getting kids more connected globally through blogs or or even letter writing, like we did with uh, with the butterfly ambassador to Mexico during their monarch their monarch butterfly study. So this this is always. While I'm doing this unit, I can I can say, oh, I need to add a little bit more here or finding resources. I keep this in mind also when I'm looking for resources on a unit because it, it guides what you need, really. So if I'm looking for something for culture or I happen to find a picture, I, I will say, oh, look, I can do this with this unit. So the five C's are really quite it's a part of of your lesson design, whether it's specific or just in your mind constantly. I yes, hope that made sense. I agree. No, absolutely. And and by constantly referring to and providing yourself with tools like this one, that is a checklist, an idea that really helps the, the teachers to, to keep things really simple. Just like we said in the beginning, if you have a checklist of ideas, if you if you have a structure for your planning, like the grid that we've provided, and you and you really focus on the three modes across each of these ideas, you're going to be able to achieve so many things that you don't think are possible. I have a question right now from one of our listeners. Um, so, Monica, can you talk a bit more about how you help the children make comparisons in the target language? In the well, very simply, I teach. I can do that. Actually, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> The great question. Um, in kindergarten, we do the five senses, and it just happens always to fall around Halloween. So you can talk about el chupacabra, or, or you know, something from your target language that that is kind of like a monster, and then talk about something that that they're familiar with and compare. Does it have uh, two eyes, or does it have three eyes? Think about anything like that. Does it have um, four legs or make it make it have five legs things like that so that's how I do 
at, at my age, those are the, the language and the, and that's a cultural comparison because you're, you're comparing two cultural legends or myths over there. In language, I'm constantly, um, my big focus on comparing language is through cognates. And what does it sound like? What do you think it sounds like? What do you think it means? How do you say this? And you'd be surprised, especially the little kids in, in um, K1 and 2, they start, they actually don't know some of these words in English. And when you do them in Spanish, they're like, oh, you mean idea is idea? And you're like, yes, that, that's it. And if you, <laughs> so have, the, if you have the opportunity, I'm, go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Monica. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, if you have the opportunity and your language has cognates, then that works perfectly. But it, yeah. but the idea of the comparison, as you explained, where you're starting early with the five senses, just like the reason we mm-hmm. chose that was on purpose, because the five senses is a it's really a pathway to broader descriptive language. And the more you provide opportunities for descriptive language, the more you can provide for the chance that students can make comparisons and contrasts. In, in my experience, working with those very young learners, the way that Monica described it, you hear she's asking them to answer yes or no questions about something to determine how things are the same or different. So for me, I would use also in addition to yes or no, I would say, is this the same or is it different? All the target language. Uh, and I would do the same thing with, you know, is it A or is it B? And then when you move, as you develop broader uh, language skills and you have older students, you can, or more experienced students, you can move farther into having them develop comparisons and contrasts about everything. You can start with pictures. You can use graphic organizers for this. And you can mm-hmm. provide, you can do brainstorming for ideas for words and ideas that, um, that they may need to have. You can provide that list of words in the first place. It's not that they need to memorize them, but they need to be able to pull from them in order to make uh, comparisons and contrasts. To go back to that example about the birthdays, the students in this French class that I was working with, after learning about the different types of birthday celebrations around the world, they had to write something that said, when I celebrate my birthday, I, and they had to complete the sentence and draw a picture of it. And then in the second part of the of the page said, but in and they had to choose one of the countries that they had talked about, um, people celebrate by and they had to use the words and the ideas they had learned going right back to the presentation that their teacher had provided for them and then showing the difference. This becomes a part of their journal, their log, their, you know, almost like a lingua folia where they're they're developing language, they're developing actually books that they can read and practice their language as well. So it goes from an interpretive task where the teacher is showing them and they're listening and learning about the different uh, celebrations to them talking about their own experiences in an interpersonal way to then becoming almost like a presentational piece at the end where they're able to write about it and and really take the ideas and pull them together. Thank you. Another we have um, at our school, we have uh, a thinking. I don't know. It's not a graphic organizers. They're they're thinking maps, which is a different way of thinking. And and I use those a lot to to get them to do these comparison things, because the thinking maps come with um, specific language that the kids use. So like pero, you know, this this one is this and this pero, which is but however, this one has this, this and this. So using all of those things that they bring in from their language arts class and their other um, academic subjects into your class, they have that structure already. So you can you can use it in your class to get them to use the language. And it's very, very simple language, but they're powerful words that they're already learning in English. So they know them and, and they're you can find um, compatible ones in, in the target language. Yes, absolutely. Um, so. What we really want to do is we want everyone to think about the, the, the bigger ideas and how you can apply them in your classroom. Your cone is just your classroom. It's, it's where you have all of this opportunity. And what we're asking you to do is move from those topics and those little ideas of teaching them small concepts, even if you only have a little bit of time with your students each week. In my case, I've only had 30 minutes with students once a week sometimes. So even if you have only a, a little time, if you broaden what you're doing, if you really focus on questions and about getting them to develop questions, and if, as Monica said, if you ask yourself what their students are going to be able to do with this and why is it important, then you're really moving them in the right direction. 
Um, in addition to that, you want to make sure that you're finding resources that that stretch your students. Those infographics, I cannot tell you how I feel that infographics really change our ability to provide comprehensible input. Whether you're creating them, finding them online, or even having your students at some levels create their own, it really makes a difference in providing that. Um, I, would I want to say some of the resources. For those of you who use music or songs in um, – in your language classes, I find now the availability of, of these resources online and in YouTube is phenomenal. And you, there's really no reason to, to translate an English song into your target language. You can find things. And I don't mind. I, I am a big proponent of I am not going to simplify something right. if it's a culturally relevant topic or they sing it in that culture. I will show them, but the kids might only you know, they'll, we'll build, we'll introduce it, build it together, but they might only learn how to do the, the refrain right. of, of a song, but right. they'll know when to go in, which I think is very important because they're getting all of that other input. And if you put images with it, they understand what the song is about, mm -hmm. but they'll, and they'll be singing with it too. So, And that's true not only about songs, but about really any concept. We go back to those infographics we showed earlier that were about families or about you know the different types of things that happen in families. Really, what we're able to do with infographics is broaden the issues and really, again, consider how mm -hmm. these concepts relate to world issues. Go back to that list of AP Global Strands again, and you'll see that so many of the things that you're already doing relate right back to that. And isn't it our yep. role to create global citizens who use language in order to answer pr questions, solve problems, and ultimately be active members of the global community? I think so, and I know Monica does too, which is why I do. <laughs> the focus on content and the focus on global citizenship and global the AP Global Strands can happen and should happen from the time they're very young learners all the way up and through. Um, and you do that by you setting your objectives to focus on things that have meaning. And the grammar and the vocabulary, don't be afraid that you're going to lose it because there's no way to teach these things unless you actually um, – have the opportunity to, to try it. Uh, we have a couple of questions here, um, Monica. The first one is, where do you find infographics? And I'll just tell you where I find them, and then Monica will share where she finds them. I think that one of the biggest keys for teachers is to actually um, Google in your target language and Google in a way that go, gets right to what your issue is. Uh, infographics, I Google in the target language for what I'm looking for, and I say infographic. If it's Spanish, I say infografica de la familia and that's how i find those things and if you look at yeah. the google the images when you google it you click the images button you'll find a ton of them i will also yeah. say that i know lori langer de ramirez was a dear colleague of mine um has a has put together a whole bunch of them on pinterest as well so uh, i know she's trying to organize them in a way that that's helpful but really keep in mind the whole concept of looking things on, looking for things online is all in the way you ask your question. And isn't that kind of what we're teaching our students to do as well? But go, go ahead, Monica, where do you find yours? No, I usually, I'm uh, really uh, probably blog addicted. <laughs> I've signed up to tons of newsletters. And through those, it's for me, it's just a matter of finding links. I mean, I found a really cute one for the holidays, I think from uh, Mundo de Pepita is an awesome, um, she has a whole bunch of them for, for comparing the holiday traditions, the Dia de los Reyes, the Three Kings Day, I'm sorry, I keep switching to Spanish, the Three Kings Day to the Santa Claus, which is very interesting. So um, I'm, I'm just scouring the internet. I don't know why I do this, but there are, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Sometimes there's too much. There's definitely too much, uh, but uh, but you have to kind of look carefully. The next question we get is 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 really the crux of why we're doing this tonight. It says most FLES classes only meet once a week. How can we integrate content into our lessons? We need to teach basic vocabulary words first. And so here's my response to that. My response is that you need to teach basic vocabulary words that are that have meaning. It has there's no meaning for I, I use the example of colors again. There's no reason yeah. for me to teach colors unless I'm teaching my students about fall and I'm teaching about the changes that take place in the fall. So I only teach the colors that go along with the fall first. And I do that as a part of uh, what I'm trying to get them to understand. And I do it through music and I do it through movement. And I do it through repetition. And I do it through lots of visuals. 
So my response to you is, to, is, yes, we have to teach basic vocabulary words, but not first. We have to teach it alongside. We have to choose yes. the words that best express the content. So, again, I would start with the concept of seasonal change in, in September and October in my school. And that would be something someplace where I would feel like the, the certain colors that go along with that will be some of the vocabulary that they learn. Does that mean I won't start with a, a, a small mini unit all about me to get them to be able to talk a little bit about themselves? No, of course, I would start with something like that. But I would do it all in the target language. And everything that I do and all of the words that I choose are words that relate back specifically to that academic content. Monica? I agree, because that's exactly how as soon as I did that, for me, it was more of a mind shift where thinking you look at at start with the vocabulary that you that you do but then think about if there's a content it's like well how can i do that it doesn't make sense to me to teach them the 11 colors what do we do with it and they're not going to at least in my school there's very few chances of these kids using spanish outside of the classroom so how can i get them to practice and i do only meet them once a week um well way back when now it's twice a week for 30 minutes not that much more but we get going but the the point is we have to get these kids to use the language and we need to and if they're not engaged they're not going to remember the words no matter how many times you you introduce them Absolutely. practice them. they've Absolutely. got to be engaged in in this and motivated to learn so if you put for the colors for example in in a context of of the penguins all right. Yeah, I'm only doing black and white and and the some penguins have yellow feathers, red feet, red eyes. It's a few colors, but those colors have more meaning um, when you do them that way. And they'll be used more often than just teaching a game, uh, you know, a color bingo game. You know, I actually put colors in everything when we do food. I, I actually we have a bingo game with food and I'll say um, algo rojo. Una comida roja, a, a red food, a, a green food, a green leafy food. So you're getting all of these adjectives in, in the content of what is a healthy plate. But but to break it down, just to answer your question, to just to answer your question really succinctly, the, the way that you need to look at it is not about introducing words first, but introducing yeah. them in line with a question, with an overarching idea and theme. Think about... Yes. Think about children's programming on television. Think about shows like Blue's Clues, like Magic School Bus, like all of those things that were created specifically to get students to think about a concept. They didn't just start with words. They got them to solve a problem or a mystery or to figure something out. I've had teachers where I've asked them to go in and start their classroom with a magic bag. And in the bag, they would pull out some items. And the students would have to try and figure out what they were going to talk about that day, if it was about weather or if it was about all different ideas. So you can approach this any way you want. But just just to keep in mind that um, – that you really need to think about the vocabulary words not being first, but being in conjunction with the broader themes. And and it doesn't, you know, think also with especially the age of your student matters. And when you're doing activities like that, it's OK if the student is responding in English at first because they don't have all of the background knowledge yet. As long as you can keep the the target language, they'll pick it up soon. And, and, you know, just to speak to this point, and thank you for your question. It's a wonderful question. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to just, you know, move us a little bit further and just uh, to say that if you have additional questions, Monica and I are both available on email and certainly online to answer your questions. The other day, this commercial came across my screen, and it couldn't <laughs> have been more perfect in the timing about why we need to make sure that language has a purpose. Mira, no am Krishna. Me no yahu. No entiendo. Wookie. Campbell's new Star Wars soups, made for real, real life. I love that commercial. To me, that is the epitome of language having a purpose. Those students were able to communicate uh, in a language that they both understood because there was a motivating factor. And that's what we're saying. The content is motivational. The content is what brings your students together around ideas. 
And, you know, this concept here on this page is really just to get you to think about how we reach out to our learners and get them excited about language learning, not for just the purpose of language learning, but to see that language is a tool for communication of all ideas. Science happens in languages around the world. There are, you know, all different things happening around the world. Artists and writers are in speaking in all different languages, writing in all different languages. And we need our students to understand that language is a living, breathing, experiential thing, not just something that is um, that is limited to lists of words or to grammar structures. Yeah. Monica, did you want to say anything else? Well, I, I like I, I I've come to realize that language delivers content. So that my teaching now is not about as much about the language as it is about what content am I going to do? Why is it that they're going to be learning this language? What will they be able to do with it? What will they be able to communicate? I think that that for me has been a, a, a shift. That's in, right. In how I do it. I've been teaching for a long time. So That's it's, right. it's Absolutely. I think that shift is really the dynamic of how we move language learning forward in our school uh, every day from now on. To end mm -hmm. tonight, I just wanted to sum this up. You're all super teachers and you all have a lot of your own skills that you bring to the table. And if you can just make learning lang language learning a, a really meaningful experience, make it matter for your students, make it be the class that they want to be in. Don't you want to be that teacher that they want to come to? And if it's fun for them and it's fun for you, they're going to know it. They're going to want to be there. They're going to strive. They're going to take risks in the language, which is ultimately what we want to see. Give them the opportunity to, to make errors and, and correct themselves and provide them with all of the input and the opportunities to take in language so that they don't feel like they have to lean on English. But they're willing to try to solve those problems and come to new ideas as a in the target language as a part of the learning. So I, you know, I really thank you all for being here tonight. Monica, I want to thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. It's been so lovely to be able to share this with everyone and to be able to talk to you like this tonight. Uh, thank you very much also. I, I, it was a great pleasure to, to be here and I thank you. <laughs> and if anyone has any further questions, you can find us at our email addresses. Certainly contact us on Twitter and on Facebook if you want. Uh, really great if you if this is something that you've enjoyed and you want to share with other people, please let people know. Uh, Flange, it will make this available online for people to download later. They can, you know, pay and download it later. Thank you so much to Monica for such an informative presentation. It's been a pleasure to be able to do this. As I said, this has been recorded and the recording will be made available on request in a few days. Uh, additional information will be sent out to you and to the Flange membership on how you can access it. And again, those of you who've uh, attended as live participants after this webinar, you will, you will get a, some proof of attendance in the form of a certificate of completion. And please join us. Uh, for uh, the next webinar that we will be hosting, and that will be uh, about Spanish heritage, Spanish for heritage speakers. And we cannot wait for that one by our very own Michelle Schreiner. Um, and that will be a wonderful opportunity for everyone to learn more. I will be sharing this information in our um, in our Flend President's message. So please look out for that. Uh, registration is already available for that. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And Monica, thank you so much. Uh, we wish you all a wonderful holiday season. And we look forward to seeing you all at upcoming Flange events. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.